so uh, thank you so much all for coming today. I'm going to give a really brief introduction so we try to keep the talk within our time limits. Um, Kempo Sedarge comes from really the largest Tibetan Buddhist monastery in the world, probably in the history of Tibet actually, at a place in northeastern Tibet called Larungar, which has, uh, maybe he'll tell us how many monks there are actually, monks and nuns there actually are, but people here, 15,000, 20,000, it's a really huge institution that's larger than most cities in Tibetan Plateau. And one of the great accomplishments of Kempo, who's really been one of the three leaders of the uh, institution, has been from the very beginning of the founding of the monastery and his own religious career, he's been focused on outreach to uh, Chinese, the Chinese community, Chinese followers of Buddhism, people in various social sectors of China who are interested in Buddhism. And he's really emerged over the years as probably the most prominent voice uh, amongst Tibetan Buddhist lamas in China for Chinese. He's produced a whole <coughs> broad variety of publications in Chinese language that are widely read and broadly read, not only by Chinese, but also by a lot of the young generations of Tibetans who are avidly interested in hearing about Buddhism and new formats and new presentations. And so just recently, he's been able to come to the U.S. He, he made two very brief visits before. Um, and so we're very happy to have him here at the University of Virginia. And I thought what would be an interesting topic would be for him to share that wealth of experience over 30 years of working together with Chinese in relationship to contemplative practices, both Chinese who are passionately Buddhist as well as Chinese who are interested in the secular adaptation of these traditions in different walks of life. And for someone like myself who Obviously, I grew up in the United States, but I spent a lot of my years of my life in China. It's often struck me that not only are America, the United States of America, and China the two most economically powerful countries in the world, but there's a lot of other things they share in terms of cultural traits. And although it may seem like those differences are much greater than the things that bind us together, when I first started spending a lot of time together with Chinese Buddhists who were interested in Tibetan Buddhism, they really reminded me very clearly of Americans who are interested in Tibetan Buddhism and who are followers of Tibetan Buddhist traditions. And so, uh, also in terms of our current interest at the University of Virginia and other universities and how to adapt practices from Buddhism and Hinduism, Christianity and other things into secular settings such as education, healthcare and entrepreneurship training, very similar things are also happening off in China. So with no further ado, I'm really happy today to welcome uh, Kempo Sodarge uh, to here at the University of Virginia, and he's going to be translated by Sangi Kandro and Lama Chunam. Very happy to have them here to lend their expertise to taking Kempo's Tibetan and rendering it into English for our understanding. So please join me in welcoming Kempo Sodarge. Tomer啊，等于打，你等到呢？啊，打木扎了，木柱，啊，天南巴土，大英荣王呢，西丘个，我说，南王个，啊，等于就南王当个样，啊，对，人都呢，大家就人民的呢，但你莫不认为，这个
And secondly, I'd like to express my joy um, in having had an opportunity to meet many of the students yesterday um, who are learning Tibetan in order to graduate and obtain degrees, uh, and the teachers who are the teacher who is teaching them, and to have had an opportunity to see the library of the Tibetan archives here in the university, and um, to answer some questions posed by those scholars who are studying about the differences between China and America and the similarities in terms of um, the way that education is carried forth. And so it made me really happy to see all that's going on here and to share with all of you. And so again, I express my gratitude. Uh, Tangy the uh Gubadan now, my own personal experience, of course, um, is uh, based in China, um, and it is there where our Tibetan tradition abides, and the teachers of these traditions. And so, um, it's due to this that I was requested by different uh, instructors and professors at colleges and universities in America to come and share my knowledge um, that I've gained from being a teacher in China, a teacher of Tibetan Buddhism, 
um, two Tibetans and also Chinese. So I've come to different universities in the past, and now I find myself here again. And this time, one of the uh, subjects of interest, which is the topic for today's lecture, is how Tibetan Buddhism is being practiced in contemporary China and how we particularly bring this tradition to the Chinese students, to those who are interested. And so, whatever the case may be, it's not really for myself something that involves many different methods or tools that we need in order to uh, reach out to the Chinese people. Um, and that I wanted to say that um, I was asked by my master, Kempo Jigme Punsok, uh, who's the founder of our monastic college, uh, to teach to the Chinese people. And so he particularly empowered me to do this. And according to our tradition, when our master asks us to do something, we respect that and we try to accomplish that. And so that's why I have been working hard really for the last 30 years, emphasizing how I can educate the Chinese people in the country where we live. And so, based on this, not just only because of my efforts, but today in China, generally, um, many, the majority of the people are getting more and more interested in spiritual development, and especially in understanding the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. There's tremendous interest to learn how to practice and study this. And in that context, particularly the youth, there are many young people who are becoming more increasingly interested in studying about Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, <laughs> Yerkum down a muddy down a yerkum that demoves you, shots of Yela, a two of you on Marie. Nambe that he draws a chicken sentence, sit down, see in that of a that chundo, a fair good that chundo, Yansel on a Yansel and ye, a tenetic that he checked in the wrong of Basil the Sonary, and Burde Paro Chigger Carnaya, Pai Catan, the down lodging, the drum down the mail carn, drug and eat down the chip. Tamchirk Garden when it comes to the Buddhist tradition from the Dharma perspective, there is equality, there are no distinctions or boundaries among people, among races, and so forth. And so the Buddha taught, as many of you most certainly know, that the Dharma is something that is meant for <laughs> all living beings if they are interested to receive it. So the beings of the six classes. and uh, it, it is a matter of being um, something that is equally uh, possible for everyone according to their capacity. And so, in lieu of that, there is one quote, or a shaloka, a four-line verse uh, from the speech of the Buddha, which is an, a kind of an aspiration. <coughs> and it reads, In the language of gods, nagas, <coughs> yakshas, kumbharas, humans, and the like, Whatever language exists in the world of living beings, may I teach the Dharma in all of those languages so that those who wish to hear may partake of it. And so that's the end of the quote. And then, um, prior to giving a teaching, um, a teacher will recite this quote, and as they're on the final verse where it says, uh, so that those who wish to hear may partake of it, they then will snap their finger. 
and you may have had the experience of hearing this and seeing this or not, whatever the case, it indicates the equality of everyone. In my case, of course, I don't even speak English, and so uh, speaking the language of the gods or the nagas would be even more difficult <laughs> than that. But um, the main point about the quote is that uh, this is something that can be heard and is meant to be heard by everyone. Now the founder of this great institution and one of the most important founding fathers of the United States, of course, as you know, Thomas Jefferson, um, he saw humanity to be equal as a birthright. And um, based on that premise, that humanity then inherently deserved freedom and inherently deserved happiness. And so whoever is born in this world has this birthright. And this view is the same view that Dharma represents and is propagating. And that is that whoever the living being is, they uh, have the capacity to be able to uh, understand the path that leads to true everlasting well-being and happiness. They have this birthright. They are born equal in terms of this, and they deserve the freedom and the dignity to pursue pursue their goals. <coughs> Now, as for myself, honestly speaking, um, I began propagating Dharma in China some 30 years ago. And uh, for quite a long time, I went through many difficulties and obstacles to overcome. Um, and in, that was in terms of giving spiritual teachings and translating teachings from Tibetan into Chinese. And um, not only during the life of my master, Kempo Jigme Punsok, but after he passed away, I continued and have continued to do so, giving continuous classes and um, 
attempting to maintain the continuity. While he was alive, I served as his personal translator, and then I've continued to propagate his teachings uh, from that time onward to the present day. Because according to the Buddhist philosophy, um, what matters most is this and the future lifetime. And so when we think of this and future lifetimes, we have to think about benefiting oneself, bringing oneself well-being and happiness, but most certainly also doing this for the benefit of others, working for the welfare of others to bring them well-being and happiness and to free them from misery and suffering. And that is the essence of Buddha's teaching. Uh, Uh, Now, initially, we began teaching to the Chinese people uh, when there was freedom to speak about spiritual subjects and so forth in the 1980s. And at that time, what we encountered more specifically when I mentioned hardships or obstacles uh, was that there were uh, two principal um, original traditions, old traditions of ancient China uh, that were still present Uh, although having diminished over the centuries of time, um, the traces of those traditions were still embedded in the minds of the people. And those traditions are Taoism, founded by Lao Tzu, and Confucianism, founded by Confucius, uh, which both, both of which more or less emerged consecutively around the same time as Buddhism, some 2,500 years ago. And so both of those lineages have continued into modern times in China. And the situation was that um, there was this rigidity or this, um, this lack of, of openness to receiving um, the spiritual teachings from the Buddhist tradition because of being so self-absorbed in the view that the views, in the terms of both of them, that they adhered to, their own philosophies. And so we found it very difficult to actually begin by teaching Buddhism openly to the people because they had these predisposed ideas. Ungutsuran <laughs> Uh 
呃，当上七十公里，打那我们亚特自己打呢。呃，打有一个三千个打呢，亚特自己公里，就能得去，差不多五百多公里。因为呢，第二呢，可能那么忙，不是个亚特打个自己打呢，没他们去个拉巴打
we should believe in the speech of the Buddha and the great scholars of the past who have never spoken anything that can be defeated, have never spoken anything that was contradictory. And um, others would argue and say, well, still, because they only believe in this lifetime, if they can't even know the truth about this lifetime, they're certainly not going to understand about the future lifetime. So just leave it. Don't even go there. And I said, no, we can't just leave it and not go there because we have to tell them what is the truth, whether they're ready to believe it or not. And this can be explained to them through logic and uh, positive reasoning. And if it's something that the Buddha taught, it is something that we must express and give to them. We shouldn't try to cover it up or water it down. Uh, Hence, in making a decision to teach them authentic dharma, then this is not a discussion of worldly understanding or worldly development, the development of positive worldly qualities. That would be a different explanation. But that spiritually, according to Buddhist teachings, the root teachings involve um, contemplation upon renunciation, the cultivation of the bodhicitta, the awakened mind, and the realization of selflessness. And so that would be the selflessness of the person, the selflessness of phenomena. And uh, <coughs> whoever is going to study Buddha Dharma and accomplish the goal of this path must simply come to know these three aspects and to internalize and realize. And so this begins by believing that there are the three realms of existence and that one needs to uh, be liberated from the three realms of existence. And if one does not understand this, then one is not going to understand the notion of renunciation, of wanting to renounce attachment to cyclic existence. So if one doesn't believe in that, then it's incomplete and there's no basis for moving on from the lower vehicle into the higher vehicle of Mahayana, which then leads one to realization. And so this is the cornerstone of the entire path of practice, and that's why we, we had to begin at that point. Mm-hmm. And these days, as a result of that, many of the teachers in the most important um, universities in China They are extremely learned. These scholars are extremely learned concerning the four thoughts of basic doctrine of Buddhism, the four thoughts that turn the mind to the spiritual path, contemplating um, the rarity of the precious human rebirth, how difficult it is to obtain, contemplating the truth of impermanence, contemplating the truth or the infallible truth of the law of cause and result, and the faults of the suffering of samsara. And so this is something that is openly not only understood but being described 
in uh, different uh, educational systems in China. Tugan now, in terms of the Confucian, Confucianism system, uh, according to their view, uh, they only believe uh, to develop compassion or um, loving, kind thoughts towards human beings, but that this attitude is not directed towards other living creatures, such as animals and insects. And um, <coughs> therefore, uh, that is something quite different from um, the contemporary Mahayana Chinese masters who draw from um, that, that um, renaissance of compassion uh, or altruism that was revived by uh, one emperor who lived about 1,500 years before, Emperor Liang Wu De. And he instigated the revival of the existing precepts for the lay community and also the monastics, which included becoming a vegetarian, vegetarianism. And uh, this was based on compassion for sentient beings, not just only humans, but for all living creatures. And so it became that, as you know today, most Chinese Buddhists, uh, they will be emphasizing compassion. They will abstain from meat eating and killing. Uh, this is more or less the direction that most people will adhere to. And um, so it's not just only limited to human beings. Uh, however, uh, because there's still the um, continuation of the Confucianism view that goes into that, there are still many who only would um, direct this compassionate attitude towards humans and not necessarily the animals. And um, so therefore, the original compassion that was uh, revived by this emperor has declined in present day times. Good <laughs> Then 
The doctrine of Mahayana Buddhism, or the greater vehicle, is not just only emphasizing compassion for human beings, but also emphasizing compassion uh, which is expressed towards all living beings equally. And the reason is because there's not a single living creature that doesn't wish for happiness. And there's not a single living creature that wants to suffer, right? And so, therefore, sentient beings in their delusion and in their confusion, um, although they wish for happiness and do not want to suffer, they contradict their wish by their actions, not knowing how to produce the causes for happiness or eliminate the causes for suffering. As the great pundit Shantideva reminded us in the quote that Kempo gave, which means precisely that, all living beings wish for happiness, but they lose the, the capacity to accomplish and establish this because they're overpowered by their own confusion or delusion. And so in Buddhist teachings, particularly here Mahayana Buddhism, then we are not directing compassion towards only human beings. Uh, there are some who have said to me, well, you can't teach that this should be directed towards other creatures such as animals and insects because that will contradict their cultural views. And I said, what do you mean? I can't change the teachings to meet the needs of, of their um, ancient cultural philosophies. I can only teach the pure doctrine of Mahayana Buddhism. I'm not going to adjust that to meet the needs of the ancient philosophy. And so whatever the Dharma tells us, whatever the Buddha taught in terms of Mahayana doctrine, it is that all beings are equal and should be treated equally in regards to this. <coughs> That's why these days in China there are many who have uh, faith and devotion who are cultivating the bodhicitta. It's difficult to say that they have cultivated it, but are working on that and are seeing all living beings in an equal way and taking the vow to continue that kind of training and practice it in a practical way, such as the application of the six paramitas. <laughs>
And other philosophies that we find prevalent in China um, in modern times include the Zen tradition, which is derived <coughs> from uh, Chen Buddhism. It can also interchangeably be called Chen Buddhism or Zen. And there, um, there is n not necessarily the inclination to put effort towards the accumulation of merit or the purification of obscurations, but to just go directly to the highest view and to sustain that view in meditation. There are many who are teaching this. There are many who are practicing this. Um, also, there are many who are practicing the Pure Land sect of Buddhism, whereby they pray to Buddhamitabha to grant them refuge and protection with devotion, the Pure Land sect. And then there are many who are practicing what's referred to as humanistic Buddhism, and that would be more of a modern-day approach whereby they want to improve this life. And that means to increase their life, their longevity. They want to increase their prosperity and abundance and make everything more fortunate and auspicious. Um, are they interested in what happens after this life or what may have happened before this life? Well, no. Um, so that means they're not interested in attaining a state of awakening that transcends worldliness. They are focused on this life's phenomena alone. And so those are the humanistic Buddhists, and there are many of them in China. And so they, f they would fall into the category of what Buddhists refer to as practitioners on the vehicle of gods and humans. And um, if that's the case, there is no liberation from samsara. And so, the main point of the <coughs> Tibetan Buddhist teaching is to study, to contemplate, and to meditate. These three are the root premise through which one is able to understand Buddha Dharma in an effective way. To hear or listen, to contemplate the meaning, reach your own conclusion in terms of the view, and then meditate upon that, at which time you are able to sever the root um, which is the cause for suffering and samsara, fixation upon the self, by realizing through prajna or incisive knowledge the selflessness of the ego or the person. And so once one is free from the self, there is the ability to awaken in a state of omniscience. And so that has been the way that Dharma has been taught from the beginning until now, and that is how we teach it in China. Ah, Nga <coughs> The <laughs> So, given that this is the way through which one develops on the path of Buddha Dharma traditionally, that is to say, to study, to contemplate, and to meditate, um, these three uh, trainings in wisdom knowledge <coughs> must be um, interchangeable and um, must be 
must n- must never be separated. Uh, so they they are always to be kept together. And if so, then um, the aspirant will be able to accomplish the status of being an authentic Dharma practitioner. Otherwise, it's difficult to say. And I bring up this point because I first came to America some 20 years ago, and at that time I did notice that there were a few authentic Dharma practitioners, or so it seemed. And now, in uh, subsequent years when I've come, I've noticed that there seem to be some authentic practitioners. Um, But when we really look at what constitutes becoming an authentic practitioner according to our tradition, when I say study, it means the study of the five categories of study according to sutra, a thorough study of the vinaya, of the pramana, which is logic or reasoning, of the abhidharma, of the madhyamaka, and of the paramitas. And that that is followed by the tantric studies of the Guyagarbha Tantra and other classifications classifications in the highest yogas of, of the Upadesha class. And so, therefore, when you think about this and about how one must rely upon qualified teachers in order to accomplish these different stages of study, um, although it seems that Dharma took root in the West in the 1960s and has been uh, propagated since then, and it more or less was revived in China in the 1980s, it seems that um, it, is, it is actually spreading and increasing more in China in an authentic way than it is in the West. Nelly <laughs> Tejenda <laughs> あ、あ、now I'm not saying this because someone else said it and I'm repeating their idea. And when I speak, I speak from my own understanding of what is true and correct that I've observed. And hopefully it is, in fact, the true condition that I'm presenting. And so, for example, at our monastic college in Tibet, uh, we have, from the time that it um, began until now, continued to teach Dharma according to these five categories of study of sutra that I just mentioned. And um, then that is followed by the subsequent studies in mantra. And as a result of that over the years, there are many Chinese students uh, who have become monastics, monks and nuns, and also lay people who have gone through this curriculum and accomplished it, many of them becoming kempos and kenmos. That means scholars, Fulbright scholars, male and female, who have uh, achieved these accomplishments, and they are capable, fully qualified to teach, just like their Tibetan lamas taught them. And so, if you really look closely at what has been accomplished by the Chinese people due to the efforts of this process that we've presented for them, 
then their knowledge that they are gaining and that and that which is um, being produced is not only of highest value but is extremely profound. This is quite unlike reading a few Dharma books and then claiming to know about Buddha Dharma, translating a few books and claiming to be a translator of Buddha Dharma, uh, or just analyzing some of the topics in a class and then considering oneself to be learned on the subject. And then uh, Ken Rinpoche gave a quote from the Sutra Palpoche, which speaks about this subject. And so we have to think carefully about how important it is in the Buddhist tradition, just as it is with any study um, or attempt to learn, that this needs to be approached gradually and systematically so that one can actually really... um, have a strong foundation in training and knowledge to accomplish the goal. あ、ちょ、ちょんちょんでね、いけしんくんもよ。レタンにんごにな、あ、た、もろ<笑><笑> Mm-hmm. There are teachers on this tour, educators, um, who have asked me, how is it that you would teach differently to the Chinese versus the Tibetans? What might that difference be? Well, I would have to say that these days in uh, modern, uh, the Tibetans in in China, um, at, at the present time, still do have faith in Dharma inherently, Uh, But except for those who become monastics and go off to the institutions to learn, many of the young people remain illiterate, unfortunately. Um, So those things have to be taken into consideration. It's not necessarily the case that the Tibetan uh, culture is uh, increasing their knowledge and education spiritually among the lay people, but more or less in the monastic institutions. Whereas um, among Chinese... um, all of the people are literate and willing to want to learn if that is their tendency. And so in my 30-year experience, I have to say that the basic principles of the Buddhist path are what I have emphasized and taught to both cultures. Um, And so that would be renunciation, cultivating bodhicitta, the reasons why this is necessary, as I've described briefly here today, and mainly emphasizing how to realize the identitylessness of self. And so, with these as the main um, curriculum for how we teach, then people are able to develop a qualified education and proceed from there, in both cases. Many of the Chinese people do continue to request for uh, Zambala empowerments. That means to be empowered to gain wealth, or longevity empowerments so that they can live longer and have a better life. I've never given any of those empowerments. I never intend to. I see no value in it whatsoever, uh, trying to get so- give someone an opportunity so that they can gain more wealth or live longer in this world so that they can have a happier samsaric life. That's not my goal. I don't spend time doing that. Uh, because I don't see any positive fruition that would be valuable, a valuable way to spend my time or theirs. And so rather than that, um, I choose authentic, traditional ways of teaching that will benefit them in the long term, rather than emphasizing something that has no essence. 
呃,是等个,你也算了当了,会那当上,就那个,当上,就那个,当上,就那个,当上,就那个,当上,就那个,当上,就那个,当上,就那个,当上,就那个,当上,就那个,当上,就那个,当上,就那个,当上,就那个,
looks up to and wants to uh, imitate what has happened here. And so because of uh, the importance of this, these values are something that all people cherish and want to be able to connect with. So those of you who are students and educators here, you simply must continue to improve the process of education which is inspired by these same values. And that means the process of preserving, protecting, and propagating these great values, uh, which have been able to be so effective in a relatively short period of time. And this is like one example that we have in our Tibetan tradition. If someone has owned an excellent golden chain, then that golden chain should not be replaced by a chain made of ordinary metal, right? And so likewise, once you have possessed such an excellent golden chain as the legacy of this institution, then the very same quality of excellent must be excellence must be sustained for future generations. Nonsanguibi, my second hope, uh, whether you are able to believe this way or not, still it's my hope for you, so I'll present it. And that is that all of you, uh, educators and students alike, will be more mindful or as mindful as you possibly can of the truth of uh, the law of karma or cause and result, cause and effect. Because at the time of our death we should find ourselves in a place where we don't have trepidation, where we don't have remorse, and we feel satisfied that we've been able to accomplish our goal in life and leave behind something valuable. Uh, so that we're not going to be facing suffering when we go on to the next experience that will follow. In regards to that, um, there's a quote from the Raja Vavadaka Sutra, which is advice to the king, uh, Galpola Dampe Do, which says, When the time for death comes, Buddha told the king, Your wealth, abundance, status, and retinue will no longer follow after you. Alone you will go, accompanied only by the shadow of your karma. So whoever you are, in regards to this truth, we're all absolutely equal this notion of equality. Buddha was telling this to the great king because he's the king and that he too must leave behind everything that is powerful and valuable and take with him what? Whatever karma has been accumulated in the mind, whether it's virtuous or non-virtuous. And so think about these things and try to uh, adopt them into your view if you can, if you would like to. <laughs> Manchiva Nang 
我说我们过来这么几样做的做人生的性别了干什么性格我的性格让人性格当代这么几样做的做人生的性别了干什么性格我的性格当代这么几样做的做人生的性别了干什么性格我的性格当代这么几样做的做人生的性别了干什么性格